do a Sumerian costume breakdown, right? Obviously, this culture was around for a very long time, so fashion did change. So we're going to sort of move slightly chrono chronologically. Um, but basically, fashion changes when the world changes. Fashion changes when it needs to change. And in Mesopotamia, fashion didn't need to change for 5,000 years. All right. The mainstay of early Mesopotamian fashion was this. It is called a kaunuke. A kaunuke. And it's this sort of wraparound skirt worn quite high on both men and women, on men sort of just under the nipple. On women, the kaunike, again, you can see here in this wonderfully detailed sculpture, it is wrapped around, was wrapped under one arm and over the shoulder of another. And take a look at the detail on this skirt. Now, this is where lots of different costume historians differ. What is that tiered skirt made out of? Take a look at those little scalloped details. All right. Some costume historians maintain that it was made of cloth. That this is just cloth cut into these wonderful leaf scalloped shapes. No Mesopotamian clothing exists, exists uh, to this day, so we just have to guess. Other historians think that it was made out of leaves, that a kanuke was made out of leaves, because they really do look like leaves, don't they? Maybe leaves that were treated, leaves that were painted, possibly. Others, however, say they were made out of feathers. I don't know. Maybe they were made of all three. This is uh, an illustration suggesting that they were made out of um, leaves. This is from a costume historian who definitely goes for the leaf theory. And this is uh, the feather theory. What's your theory? I think the jury is still But let's break down the structural elements of Byzantine clothing. You can see everything was based on wraps at the beginning of this culture, but then we start seeing tailored garments. Um, later on in the Assyrian era. Um, garments with sleeves, for example. But one thing we know the uh, Mesopotamians gave us was fringe. They were nuts for fringe. We see it on carvings. We see it on sculptures. This was a culture that really used clothing to reflect itself, to reflect status. Fringe on everything. It must have been spectacularly exotic. And of course, clothing as status. Of course, there was a so social strata in Mesopotamia. It was a business hub, so people were going to have a social structure, and indeed they did. And obviously the people at the top of it, the royals, the aristocrats, uh, the big-time landowners, they are going to use clothing as status. And you can see, take a look at this um, relief here. This is of a character we're going to be looking at in a second. Take a look at all of those elements of clothing. Um, he is wearing a tunic and over the tunic he has um, garments wrapped which were embroidered. They were uh, made of silk, they had uh, embroidery, they had fringe, they had a lot going on. Take a look at the coloured, no, coloured by us, middle um, image here and you can really get an idea that a lot was going on. The more that was going on, the more status you had and then again this is uh, an image that we looked at a little bit earlier. A lot of gold was used, we, we feel, during the Mesopotamian era. So this was very flashy clothing. Get away from this idea that people in the ancient world wore neutrals. They didn't.
colour was so important to them, more important than it is to us today, because we all go around in black, grey and neutrals. Oh my goodness, that would not have been very fashionable in Mesopotamia. But where the Mesopotamians really showed their style was in their gold. Their work with gold, their work with bronze. Look at these headdresses and crowns. Now, obviously, if you were a baker's wife, you did not wear one of these. These were for royals. These were for high priestesses. But take a look at the detail. The flowers. Flowers were such an important motif in Mesopotamian, Assyrian and Babylonian fashion. And they still are today. I'm sure we all own a print dress, if we're a lady, uh, or a, a top or something with a floral print. Florals were big way back then as well. Look at the detail, the leaves, the filigree. It's just incredible. The earrings. Look at these necklaces and rings. Absolutely gorgeous. Gold, bronze, stone, beadwork. This is ancient stuff. And none of this is necessary to survive on the planet as a human being. To survive on the planet as a human being, you do not need to be wearing a gold crown with leaves and flowers springing out of it. It's not necessary. So look, we're seeing fashion really being used to signify something else. Status, spirituality, money, or oh man, just good old-fashioned style. Look at my new ring. Look how fashionable I am. Look how rich I am. Look how trendy I am. Let's take a look at hair and beauty. Well, so many Mesopotamian sculptures show guys with long, crinkly beards, with matching long hair. We know absolutely that these beards were either curled artificially and they were certainly treated with oils. Beards are important to Mesopotamians and they still are. When we look through the ancient world we'll find that beards signify wisdom. Um, so whenever you see a beard on an ancient sculpture or an ancient uh, painting this guy was wise. He was older, he was wiser, he had status. But we know that beards were important. But so were shaved heads. Look at this guy, he doesn't have a beard, he has a shaved head. And there are a lot of statues like this. And so obviously to shave your, your head and be clean shaven, that had a status too. Maybe some kind of priest. And women's hair was certainly coiffed. Uh, Mesopotamian uh, ladies seem to wear these kind of bulbous updos. We see it so often that this really was the hairdo of the Fertile Crescent. What about makeup? We know they wore makeup and I'm sure that it was extremely exotic because look at their clothing, look at their jewellery. It was so exotic, it was so flashy that their makeup probably was too. And we know for a fact they wore makeup because a lot of it has remained intact, like this shell, which is full of eye makeup, a pigment, a powdered pigment in this wonderful blue, which must have been even more blue uh, four or five thousand years ago to use as eyeshadow. And we know that it went on the eyes because so many of the sculptures that remain have detachable eyes and each are lined with eyeliner, <laughs> sort of. And so we know that they used eye makeup. But another continuum we're going to be uh, looking at, especially in the ancient world, is this idea that time robs history of colour. Think about it. Anything that's left over from the ancient world has lost its colour. Everything is the colour of sandstone or white marble or granite. 
Everything is neutral or white. So when we get a statue like this, and look at her hairdo, it's a bit like a Princess Leia from Star Wars, isn't it? With these two um, sort of buns on either side of her ears. When we get a statue like this, it's so easy to forget that her clothing would not have looked like this 5,000 years ago. We know that Mesopotamia was alive with color. Look at the gate of Ishtar, and then look at her. You know that she was going to be ablaze with color because exotic color was so important to the Mesopotamians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the whole culture of Sumer. Their incredible gold headdresses and earrings and necklaces. And we know they wore a lot of makeup. This was an exotic look. And now that we've brought color into her look, she fits in to her world. Because fashion is not an island, it's a response.